You may have a seat. Thank <laughs> you. 
chief assistant and ADA Hunter. Um, Benny's not here, Crystal is not here, so they're looking for a substitute IT person to come in to assist. <laughs> time of arrival for attorney Tucker is the next three or four minutes so I am going to step off hopefully the IT person will get here just to see what difficulties there are that they can um, fix and what we can do is I mean I know you have to give this a little charge there's two openings and at least our first witness does not require any of the technology as far as the volume but, okay. after, that we but after the first witness you will okay all right so let me step off for just a minute and I'll be right back.
afternoon again, everyone. We do have a fairly full courtroom, and so there are expected protocols and decorum. Uh, there should be no conversations that are carried on, uh, no loud exclamations, any facial expressions that will distract the jury in any way. Um, and so those are the court's expectations that everyone will conduct themselves uh, with the decorum that I've just outlined. With respect to time frames, when I give a time frame, I do expect that there will be adherence to that time frame in terms of when we commence, when we recess, and when we adjourn. So um, if everyone would adhere to that, that would be greatly appreciated. I think it will um, certainly move things along effectively. Uh, I am it. Are councils ready? Judge, the state is ready. We do have, um, I anticipate that I will be invoking the rule of sequestration. I'm sure the defense will join in on that. The victim's rights and statutes and constitutional amendment permit in a murder case that the next one member of the next kin is permitted to remain in the courtroom. And we are requesting that that be permitted. Uh, she is the first witness uh, and is only going to testify regarding a very minute things. She is not a fact witness as far as the incidents that are concerned. And we would request that she be permitted to remain in the courtroom uh, through the charge process and the opening statement. Okay. No and objection as long as she abides by the court's instructions on a man uh, stay in a, a manner that is appropriate for the court. Okay. The court will grant the request. Thank you, Jennifer. And the rule of sequestration has been invoked. If there is anyone in the courtroom who is going to be called as a witness, then we're going to ask you to step outside until you're called. Okay. Um, I am going to bring the jurors in at this time. You can bring down the next one. a first time for everything and um, generally when we stand we expect the jurors to come in I'm sure they will be here in just another moment or two Welcome back, members of the jury. Hope you all had a good lunch. You've been sworn and empaneled to try this criminal case entitled The State of Georgia versus Hannah Renee Payne. During the uh, introduction, I did read the indictment to you. I am going to do so again. I'm going to go ahead and read the indictment. 
State of Georgia, County of Clayton, in the Superior Court of said county, the grand juror selected, chosen, and sworn for the County of Clayton to wit, Count One, the grand jurors aforesaid in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the State of Georgia, charge and accuse Hannah Renee Payne with the offense of malice murder in violation of OCGA 1651A for the said accused person in the County of Clayton and State of Georgia on or about the 7th day of May 2019 did unlawfully with malice aforethought cause the death of Kenneth Herring, a human being, by shooting him with a firearm. Count two. The grand jurors aforesaid in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia charge and accuse Hannah Renee Payne with the offense of felony murder in violation of OCGA 1651C for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia on or about the 7th day of May 2019 while in the commission of the offense of aggravated assault as alleged in count 3, a felony, did cause the death of Kenneth Herring, a human being. Count three, the grand jurors aforesaid in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia charge and accuse Hannah Renea Payne with the offense of aggravated assault in violation of OCGA 16521 for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia on or about the 7th day of May 2019 did make an assault upon the person of Kenneth Herring with a firearm, a deadly weapon. Count four. The grand jurors aforesaid in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia charge and accuse Hannah Renea Payne with the offense of felony murder in violation of OCGA 16.51c for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia on or about the 7th day of May 2019, while in the commission of the offense of false imprisonment, as alleged in Count 5, a felony, did cause the death of Kenneth Herring, a human being. Count 5. The grand jurors aforesaid, in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia, charge and accuse Hannah Renea Payne with the offense of false imprisonment in violation of OCGA 16541 for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia on or about the 7th day of May 2019 in violation of the personal liberty of Kenneth Herring did unlawfully detain Kenneth Herring without legal authority. Count 6. The grand jurors aforesaid in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia charge and accuse Hannah Renea Payne with the offense of possession of firearm during commission of a felony in violation of OCGA 1611-106 for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia on or about the 7th day of May 2019, did have on her person a Springfield 9mm, a firearm, during the commission of the crime of malice murder, as alleged in count one, a felony, a crime involving the person of Kenneth Herring. The grand jurors aforesaid in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia, charge and accuse in count seven, Hannah Renea Payne, with the offense of possession of firearm during commission of a felony in violation of OCGA 1611-106 for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia on or about the seventh day of May 2019, did have on her person a Springfield 9mm, a firearm, during the commission of the crime of felony murder, as alleged in count two, a felony, a crime involving the person of Kenneth Herring. Count eight, the grand jurors aforesaid, in the name of and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Georgia, charge and accuse Hannah Renea Payne with the offense of possession of firearm during commission of a felony in violation of OCGA 1611-106 for the said accused person in the county of Clayton and state of Georgia 
on or about the 7th day of May 2019, did have on her person a Springfield 9mm, a firearm, during the commission of the crime of felony murder, as alleged in count 4, a felony, a crime involving the person of Kenneth Herring. Contrary to the laws of said state, the good order, peace, and dignity thereof, Tracy Graham Lawson, District Attorney, Clayton Superior Court, May 2019. To this indictment that I've just read to you, the defendant has pled not guilty and denies each and every allegation therein. This is what forms the issue that you have been selected, sworn, and empaneled to try. Now, as I indicated to you before in the voir dire process, I'm not going to ad lib because the information I'm about to read to you is very, very important. So, I am going to be reading quite a bit. I'm asking for your attention and your patience while I do so. I am going to give you preliminary instructions on fundamental principles of criminal law. I will also instruct you on the role of the judge, the jury, and the lawyers and give you an overview of the trial procedure. The defendant is charged in the indictment with crimes that are violations of certain laws of the state of Georgia. I want to emphasize to you that the indictment including all the eight counts that I just read, and the plea of not guilty are the legal procedures by which these criminal charges are brought against the defendant. The charges and the plea of not guilty are not evidence of guilt, and you should not consider them as evidence or implication of guilt of any crime whatsoever. The defendant is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. The defendant enters upon the trial of this case with a presumption of innocence in her favor, and this presumption remains with the defendant until it's overcome by the state with evidence that is sufficient to convince you, the jurors, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant is guilty of the crimes charged. No person shall be convicted of any crime unless and until each element of the crime is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof rests upon the state to prove every material allegation of the indictment and every essential element of the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the state is not required to prove the guilt of the accused beyond all doubt or to a mathematical certainty. A reasonable doubt means exactly what it says. It is a doubt of a fair-minded, impartial juror honestly seeking the truth. It is a doubt based upon common sense and reason. It does not mean a vague or arbitrary doubt, but it is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence, a conflict in the evidence, or any combination of these. There is no burden of proof upon the defendant whatsoever, and the burden never shifts to the defendant to prove their innocence. If after giving consideration to all the facts and circumstances of this case, your minds are wavering, unsettled, or unsatisfied, then that is a doubt of the law, and you should acquit the defendant. But if no doubt exists in your minds about the guilt of the accused, then you will be authorized to convict the defendant. If the state fails to prove the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, it would be your duty to acquit the defendant. Under our system of justice, it is my duty as a trial judge to determine the law that applies to this case and to instruct you as the jurors on the specific rules of law that you must apply to the facts in arriving at your verdict. During the trial, I may be called upon to rule on motions or objections to evidence. 
Nothing I say in making these rules in, rulings or at any time during the trial is evidence and should not be considered as an indication that I have any leaning in this case whatsoever. My only interest in this case is to see that it is fairly tried according to the laws and the Constitution of the State of Georgia and the Constitution of the United States. Counsel serve as advocates for their clients and are duty bound to represent their clients to the best of their ability. The lawyers also serve as officers of this court and as such are bound to follow applicable laws, trial procedure, and rules of evidence during the trial. If at any time the lawyers believe that any law, procedure, or rule of evidence is being violated, they may make motions regarding the conduct of the trial or objections to the admission of evidence. In making those objections and those motions, the lawyers are simply seeking to fulfill their duties to their clients and to the court. Sometimes it's going to mean that the court has to consider the objections and motions outside of your presence. In that event, we will excuse you, you will retire to the jury room, but we will try to minimize these interruptions and the length of these interruptions in this regard. I will now describe to you the trial procedure. First, the attorneys for both sides have the opportunity to make what is called an opening statement and they will do so very shortly. The opening statement is not evidence. Neither party is obligated to make an opening statement. Remember what the lawyers say in their opening statements is not evidence, but is an outline of what you can expect the evidence to be. Second, following the opening statements, evidence will be presented by the state in support of the charges contained in the indictment. Evidence can be in the form of testimony given by witnesses or physical evidence. Third, after the state has presented its evidence, the defendant may also present evidence, but the defendant is not obligated to do so. The burden is always on the state to prove each essential element of the offense charged against the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. The law never imposes on the defendant in a criminal case the burden of testifying, calling any witnesses, or introducing any evidence whatsoever. After the presentation of all the evidence, the attorneys will have the opportunity to do what is called a closing argument or summation. At this time, the attorneys may suggest which laws are applicable and how they should be considered in light of the evidence and point out to you certain parts of the evidence that they think are favorable to their position. What is said in closing arguments, just as what is said in opening statement, is never evidence. The goal of the closing argument is to persuade you to decide the case in their favor. Following the closing arguments, I will charge you more specifically on the law that applies to this case. I will then ask you to retire to the jury room to deliberate and to reach a verdict. As jurors, you have a very significant and important role. It is your duty to determine the facts of this case and to apply the law that I will give you to the facts of this case. I will instruct you on the laws that you are to apply. Evidence by definition is the means by which any fact in issue is established or disproved. Evidence consists of two things, testimony and exhibits. The object of this trial, ladies and gentlemen, is to discover the truth. During the trial, the admission of evidence will be governed by certain rules of evidence. These rules were drafted with one prominent purpose in mind, and that purpose is the discovery of truth. During the trial, the attorneys have a right to object to the admission of evidence if they believe its admission would violate the rule of evidence. I will admit and exclude evidence according to those rules. 
if I overrule an objection, that means that you are allowed to consider the evidence being offered. On the other hand, if I sustain an objection, this means you may not consider the evidence being offered. You should only consider that testimony and those exhibits that are admitted and you should draw no inferences and make no assumptions about the evidence objected to if the objection was sustained. You, the jury, must determine the credibility and believability of the witnesses. It is for you to determine which witnesses or witnesses you will believe and which witness or witnesses you will not believe if they are those that you do not believe. As a fact finder, it is your duty to believe the witnesses whom you think are most believable. It is for you alone to determine what testimony you will believe and what testimony you will not believe. It is very important that you pay close attention to the ev evidence as it's presented during the trial. If you're need, in need of a recess at any time, Please raise your hand and I will recognize it because it's very vitally important that you are as comfortable during this process so that you can focus on the evidence being presented. I know your seats are probably very hard. If you feel you need to bring a cushion in to make it more comfortable so that you can pay attention to the evidence, then certainly feel free to do so tomorrow. It is very important that you view the evidence with an open mind at all times and reach no final conclusions until the trial is over. Do not jump to conclusions before all of the evidence is presented. Also remember during the course of this trial, it would be improper for you to discuss this case with anyone or to allow anyone to discuss this case with you or in your presence. This applies even to discussions among yourselves in the jury room or elsewhere before actual deliberations begin. Should anyone try to discuss this case with you or in your presence, please get that person's name and report it to one of the bailiffs or to me. It is also important that you do not talk with any of the attorneys, the defendant, or any witnesses in this case at any time about anything during the course of this trial. This is necessary because not only must you be impartial, you must also appear to be impartial at all times. For this reason, if you see any of the attorneys in the hallway or an elevator, they will likely avoid you, avoid speaking to you, or they may not even acknowledge your presence. They're not being impolite. Rather, they're simply following the protocol as enunciated by the court. With respect to note taking, you've been given notepads and pencils and pens for use during the course of the trial. You may take notes, but you're not required to do so. If you decide to take notes, remember that note taking should not divert your attention uh, from paying attention to the evidence and evaluating witnesses' credibility. Your observation of the witnesses during their testimony can be vital to your determination of the believability of their testimony. The notes that you take are for your use only and are not to be shared with anyone else until you begin deliberation with your fellow jurors. Notes are not evidence, but are only aids to your memory and should not take precedence over your recollection. It is the duty of each jury, juror rather, to recall the evidence, and while you may consider another juror's notes to refresh your memory, you should rely on your own recollection. Again, your notes must be left in the jury room except when you're in the courtroom. You will not receive a transcript of the testimony of any of the witnesses, so you must remember in the way that you can what works best for you, what the witnesses have said on the witness stand, and after the trial is over, the notes will be collected and destroyed. 
I instruct you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that you must decide this case for yourself solely on the testimony that you hear from witnesses and the exhibits admitted into evidence. I am instructing you during the course of Wardar, you heard, you heard incident location, Forest Parkway, Riverdale 85. I'm instructing you um, not to visit the location, to do any sort of investigation. Um, you're instructed to stay away from the incident location. You may not read or listen to any accounts of the trial that may appear in the news media. And they are present in the courtroom, but you're not to go do an independent research or listen to the news during the pendency of this trial. The court may repeat or remind you of these rules during the course of the trial. And now my preliminary introductions to you are complete. Thank you for your attention. At this time, I'm going to allow the state to make its opening statement. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> On May the 7th of 2019, defendant Hannah Renee Payne had the audacity to chase, corner, detain, assault, shoot, and kill an unarmed 62-year-old Kenneth Harry who was sitting in his own car. All because she didn't like his driving and she didn't like how he acted. This story begins with Kenneth Herring in his car, driving along, and there's pretty much no doubt that he runs a red light in the area that we've all been talking about, near Forest Parkway and Riverdale Road. When he runs that red light, this defendant and another uh, tractor trailer were coming toward that intersection. And Mr. Harry hits the trailer of the tractor trailer. This defendant sees it, and there's another witness who sees it, a correctional officer by the name of Terry Robinson. And everybody pulls off to the side to deal with the fact that there's just been a traffic accident. 911 is called to say, here we are, there's a traffic accident, Mr. Robinson calls 911, and so does the defendant. And there are the truck driver, the defendant, Terry Robinson, and Mr. Herring kind of hanging out on this scene. As it so happens, that just happened to be one of the worst traffic days in that area. 285 was shut down because a battery truck had caught on fire. So law enforcement is kind of blocking the entrance and exits for 285, and then there's another accident somewhere else in that area. So traffic is piled up, cars everywhere, no one can really get anywhere. And it's taking law enforcement a few moments to get to the scene. Well, the defendant didn't like that. She didn't like how long it was taking. And you'll hear that she called back. But you're also going to hear that Terry Robinson called. And he called because he had concerns for Mr. Harry. He, Mr. Harry appeared somewhat confused after the accident. He kept saying, who hit me? What's happening? Things along those lines. And then started saying things like, I didn't do anything wrong. Some confusion going on with Mr. Harry. And Mr. Robinson is going to tell you that not only is he a correctional officer, he's a correctional officer at a medical prison. And that he made some observations of Mr. Harry that led him to believe that it was a medical issue. He did not observe anything that made him believe that Mr. Herring had been drinking or that he was under the influence of anything. Just that 
he was having some sort of medical issue. And he w would say that it was consistent with medical issues he's observed in the medical prison with people who are having issues with diabetes. And he will testify that he also observed needles in Mr. Herring's vehicle while they're hanging out on scene. And he will tell you that, that for those 20 or so minutes that everyone is on this scene, no problems. As far as no arguments, Mr. Herring says nothing to the defendant. He does nothing to the defendant. There's no hand gestures. You're number one in my book. I was, was talked about some in jury selection. None of that. Because Mr. Robinson knew it's best to keep everybody kind of separated and calm. So it's a pretty calm scene. And he will also tell you that there was extensive damage to Mr. Herring's vehicle. Stuff coming out the front, fluid leaking out of the bottom. It's not going to be running for long. He realized at some point, Mr. Robinson did, that Mr. Herring's kind of circling his vehicle. And they begin to think, uh, you know, if he doesn't know what's going on, he might get in his car and drive somewhere. So that's why Mr. Uh, Robinson calls 911 a second time saying, listen, I asked y'all for an ambulance 20 minutes ago. Something's not okay here. Something's wrong with this gentleman. Where's the ambulance? And the defendant calls. Well, I called y'all 20 minutes ago. And then starts saying, I think he's going to leave the scene. And sure enough, Mr. Herring does get in his vehicle and begin driving. And the defendant, even though it had the first accident really didn't have very little to do with her, has the audacity to get in her vehicle and chase him. And while she's driving off, Mr. Robinson is basically saying, well, Maybe you can get a picture of the tag or get the tag number. Maybe you can get that information. The defendant is narrating what she's doing to the 911 operator. Who, of course, of course, tells the defendant, ma'am, don't chase him. That's not safe. Don't follow him. We don't, we don't need you to do that. But this defendant, as far as she was concerned, was the rightest person she knew. Because she tells that 911 operator, well, I'm not not going to follow him. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't like how he's driving, basically. And follows him. And you're going to hear from witnesses who say they saw the defendant, ironically, driving very aggressively to try to chase down the person who had a traffic accident a few moments ago, or 20, 30 minutes earlier, cutting people off, almost hitting people, <clears throat> jumping over a median, to then block Mr. Herring in. You're not going to hear any evidence that she's law enforcement of any kind, has any authority to arrest him, write him any tickets, nothing. Just her authority comes solely from audacity, blocks him in. Now, all of this is narrated on an L11 call. And you will hear the defendant screaming, get out of the car! Get out of the car! And witnesses will tell you that she jumps out and is going straight to his driver's side. And one witness will tell you she thought that she was hitting the window. But it turns out Mr. Harry's window is part of the way down. And that this defendant is reaching in to where Mr. Harry is sitting in the car, in the truck. A vehicle that she basically pulls over, even though, number one, she was told not to. Number two, she had already given law enforcement his tap number. And number three, she knew that law enforcement was in the area. You can you'll hear that. Because she tells she talks about it on the 911 call. 
And she knew that the car wasn't going to go very far. She says that on the 911 call. His car's smoking and stuff, so he's not going to get far. So she could have backed off and just let it be. Nope. Not good enough. So she's jumping out, jumping out screaming. And the witnesses will tell you that they observed her being the primary aggressor. The defendant reaching in and assaulting Mr. Herring. And that they never saw Mr. Herring do anything to the defendant. The most that anyone saw Mr. Herring do is kind of a get away from me. He doesn't know who she, he doesn't know her. Kind of a get away. But they never saw him strangle her, hurt her, punch her, nothing. And nothing in his hands. Unarmed. But what happens is because Mr. Harry is trying to defend himself, he moves his vehicle, or either his vehicle goes into gear, is already still in gear. Either his vehicle is still in gear, and while he's trying to deal with the defendant at his door, his car moves forward. And what happens is that he bumps into her Jeep. Her black and pink Jeep. And she's going to tell you, you're going to hear her say that that's why she shoots him. And once that happens, you'll hear an escalation in what she's saying. Get the fuck out of the car! Get the fuck out of the car! I will shoot you! I will shoot you! And that's what the witness is heard. This is not something she's saying to herself in the privacy of her own vehicle for her own release. She's standing right up on Mr. Harry with a gun in her hand. The witnesses will tell you at some point during, while well, she's at the door, she takes a gun off her hip and is pointing that gun in the vehicle. She's the aggressor. That's what the witnesses are going to tell you. You'll hear all of this. But she's still on the phone with 911. Phone's a little further away from the window because it's on the ground. Mr. Heron is trying his best not to get shot at this point. Still no weapon. Still trying to, trying to get the gun away from him, away from her, whatever. He's the, she's the only one with a weapon. So he is trying to defend himself. And after she shoots him, she picks up the phone with the 911 operator going, ma'am. Ma'am, you are not supposed to follow him. She's going to tell you. The very first thing she says, he hit my car. That's what she says. You will hear her tell you in her own words why she killed this man. And then she tells the 911 operator, he pulled the trigger on my gun and shot himself. That's the level of audacity you're going to hear. Trying to claim this man would shoot himself. When we believe that the evidence will show through the witnesses, video, photographs, will prove otherwise. And we expect that you will hear that the law will tell you that doesn't matter anyway. Because if she's the primary aggressor, Mr. Harry can defend himself. But he still never has a weapon, gets out of the car, or does anything. Other than, as you will see, hands up. Maybe trying to get her out of his window. Law enforcement is in the area. In fact, she's still basically on the phone with 911 when they get there. Because, as I just told you, there's a lot of traffic in the area. Cars can't really go anywhere. Nobody's going anywhere fast. So there are other drivers who watch this happen. There are people who are behind the defendant. 
behind Mr. Herring's car, beside Mr. Herring's car. There are witnesses who watch it. And one of them runs to where he can see that the police are blocking the interstate and comes down there and says, she just shot somebody. Somebody just got shot. Please come down here. And law enforcement gets there. And as soon as they arrive, they ask, who shot? And the defendant says, I did. And is allowed to politely hand over her gun to a police officer. And you'll see some additional audacity of kind of arguing with the witnesses on scene before she's taken into custody on that scene. You're going to hear from several of those eyewitnesses who were in that traffic area who will tell you who they saw armed, who they saw being aggressive, who they saw being violent. And that it was never on any at any moment Kenneth Herring. You'll, you'll be able to hear the defendant's own demeanor afterward. Because for some bit of time, she's still talking to 911. And you'll hear her say, well, I'm okay, or I'm safe, but he ain't. Now he needs paramedics. You'll be able to see after the uh, one of the witnesses who happens to be driving by pulls out his cell phone and videos what portion of it that he could capture. And so not only will you hear her demeanor, her audacity, what we contend will be her malice, you will be able to see some of it. You will see what happens. She picks up her phone, tells them he needs paramedics, and just walks off. Walks off to her car. During this incident at the door, there's a tear to her shirt. So she puts on another shirt, hangs out, the law enforcement gets there. You can hear that there are, doc there's documentation in the vehicle consistent with Mr. Herring being on insulin. You're going to see that there's needles in the car. His sister is going to tell you that he was an insulin-dependent diabetic. You're going to hear from the medical examiner who will tell you that this gunshot was the cause of his death and that all of his toxicology screens were negative. He was not drinking. He was not on drugs. Nothing. But we expect that you'll hear some further audacity today. regarding trying to say some bad things about Mr. Herring. We expect that you'll hear some claims that Mr. Herring was the aggressor, despite the fact that he was chased down <coughs> and cornered and unarmed. That you'll hear a request to consider self-defense for this defendant despite the fact that we expect the evidence will show that she's not defending herself. She's the aggressor. And anything Mr. Herring did would be to save, try to save his own life, even though he failed. You're also going to hear some scientific evidence. We're just trying to make sure that you have all of the evidence that we have that we can present to you. They attempted to get fingerprints off the gun. You'll see the gun. They weren't able to do so. There are some prints, but they didn't have anything sufficient to match it to. So no match to any of the prints they believe that they can find on the slide of the gun. you got to have a big enough surface to leave the fingerprint. So the slide of the gun is what they did. No match. They then swabbed the gun to see 
Let's see what the DNA is. And the only DNA that they can match to any one person is the defendant's own DNA is on the slide of that gun. Not a shocker, it's her gun. There were at least three DNA profiles on the gun. We know one is male, and that's all we know. One's a defendant, two additional, one is male, and that they could not match the male DNA to Mr. Heron. They just didn't, they couldn't create a match to the other two profiles. So we're just going to make sure you know that there's going to be some scientific evidence that's coming your way, just to make sure that you have the full picture. You're going to hear multiple 911 calls, two from Terry Robinson, two from the defendant, and one from one of the eyewitnesses. You'll see multiple photographs, body-worn camera of the initial responding officer, to just kind of, when you see, see kind of the chaos of the scene, how the vehicles are parked, all of those things. Okay, so I know this is, as we talked about when we were talking about in, in jury selection zone, we thought we were going to be putting up witnesses yesterday. So we have our exhibits numbered well in advance. So I promise you, you're going to think when we start telling you what exhibit we're tendering that we can't count. I promise that we can. We're just going to have to go in the order that we have to go in because I've told you there are some professional witnesses. There are some out-of-state witnesses. And we thought we were going to put those people up yesterday. So we start out, with, you know, we're going to start with number one. But if we end up jumping to number 12, we promise. We can count. So just kind of bear with us. And then we have to go in the order now that we have to go in. That may not seem as smooth, but just to ensure that we are able to get all of these witnesses to appear before you so that you can hear the full story of what happened to Kenneth Herring on May the 7th of 2019. So we appreciate your attention on behalf of Mr. Herring's family. We appreciate your patience, your attention. And at the end of this trial, ADA Nigel Hunter is going to come before you and talk to you about the audacity that you heard, about the malice that you are going to hear, about the felonies that were create, that were committed by this defendant with no justification whatsoever, and she will request that you speak the only verdict that tells the truth about what happened to Kenneth Herring on May the 7th of 2019. And that is that this defendant is guilty of malice murder, felony murder, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Assistant. Yeah, Attorney. You may approach. Okay.
your opening statement. And I apologize, you'll have to sit through uh, a lengthy period for us to clarify a few things, but um, we're here. This is what we discussed when we were talking about it and trying to make sure that y'all had an open mind, a fair mind, and an impartial mind, because there's been a lot of media coverage. There's been a lot of talk about this. And it's finally come the day to put up a shot. And as I talked to y'all earlier, making references, when I start a trial or do a jury trial, I try to give something that guides you into keeping your attention into what's going on in the case and kind of an underlining theme to keep, keep your eyes open. And when I was thinking of this case, of course, the evidence will speak for itself. That's the one thing we'd like to come out is the evidence. But we also talked about <clears throat> reading between the lines making inferences and looking at the veracity of the witnesses, which kind of brought this story to me basically of a young boy who was out there learning how to shoot a bow and arrow. And he's out there and he's got his father over there and he's trying to learn to shoot that bow and arrow and as most people start, he's not coming anywhere close to the bullseye or to the target. So he's out there trying left and right and the neighbor keeps coming up and kind of laughing at him, saying, good luck, boy, try, try differently, try my way. And the dad says, no, no, stick the course, do it yourself, watch, learn, listen. You'll never learn anything, you just take somebody else's word for it. So he continues to shoot this bow and arrow, and he's missing, and his dad walks off. And the neighbor says, well, one day, son, when you want to learn how to shoot a bow and arrow, come on over here. And look at this, and he points, lo and behold, there's a tree, and it's got an arrow right in the smack middle of a, a target. And then he looks at another tree, and there's that arrow, boom, right in the middle of the heart of that, uh, that target, the bullseye. And he sees another one, and that young boy, just like any other kid, looks around, sees his dad's not there, and he runs over to the neighbor. He says, sir, show me how to do that. I can't hit the bullseye. Can you show me how to do it? He goes, maybe a little later, boy. Maybe, maybe a little later. The kid's shaking his head because he really wants to know how to do it. So he walks up on the, the man. He's in there talking to his friends. And he begs him, sir, show me how to shoot. i, I got to be a, an archer like you. I want to be able to hit the bullseye all the time. And the man says, look, son, I don't have time for you today. Let me just tell you how you do it. I take that bow and arrow, I shoot it into a tree, and then I paint the bullseye around it. And that's what's happening here. We got a situation, and let me, for the record, make it clear. This is a tragic situation. It's a tragic situation because one man has lost his life, and the other person has lost their chance to ever really live a normal life. So as we go through here, and we see people try to paint a bullseye around an individual, that paint's not gonna be there. That's not gonna be enough evidence to make it look like a bullseye. It's not even gonna be enough evidence to make it look like a target. So when you hear the evidence, and we anticipate the evidence to come out and talk about an accident, not a fender bender, an accident. A truck that runs a red light, nails, not just hits, nails an 18 wheeler. It disables it, puts it to the side. The correctional officer does show up on the scene. He identifies himself as a law authority and a correctional officer. And he's trying to take control of the scene and make sure everything's going on. Unfortunately, like a lot of times in Clayton County, the 911 and the authority doesn't show up in time. People are getting impatient, worried. Is he injured? Is he going to have enough you know, time for somebody to come in and help their injuries? And in the meantime, the individual that caused the accident is walking around. He's checking out his truck, make sure it's working. He's walking around, a little aggressive, a little faster this time. And on that 911 call, 
You're going to hear the correction officer say, Sir, get away from that video. That thing's about to blow. It's, it's smoking. You got radiator fluid coming out of it. This thing's not operational. Move away from it. And he turns and he talks to the Don Juan operator and says, Man, if he's over here getting. He's getting a little crazy. I mean, we don't know what he's going to do. And then you hear him again. Say, sir, get away. From that. Don't, don't, don't you leave. Don't you leave. And he turns. And starts getting a little bit more excited. And he's just, sir, get a picture of that. Somebody get, get a picture of that. Finally, Hannah is on the phone with 911. Telling them pretty much the same thing. Man, what, what? I don't know if this guy's leaving the scene. Get the tag number, get the tag number. And the correction officer, get the tag number. Go, go, go. That's what you're going to hear on I'm the one. You're not going to hear anything different. You're going to hear that. You're going to get to decide what was meant when he tells her, go, 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 go. get that tag. And she's on the phone with 911. And of course, 911 hearing, both, can you get the tag? She goes, yes, ma'am, I can. I can get the tag. And the calm. Not an excited voice, calm voice. Did we get it? And then there's kind of radio silence. No one's really having much of a discussion because in the end, to make sure justice is accomplished, they want to see the tag number to identify who the thing, who caused this action, to hold them accountable. And therefore, they say, Nothing. They just let her get the tag. She starts rattling off the tag. Then all of a sudden, it's like, man, we don't want you to pursue you. We want your safety. We want for your safety to stop pursuing and to come back to the scene of the accident. And that's where she says, man, I'm not going to knock down. I mean, he's already caused one accident. Can I just kind of lay back, scoop back a little bit more, but make sure the authorities know this is the vehicle they're looking for? He says, no, I want you both, both, come back right now. And that's where she pulls in front. And then you'll see, and you'll hear from witnesses, and you'll get to see the vehicle. She didn't ram them. She didn't cut them off. There's, there's enough road out there on uh, Forest Parkway and River Road. You, you can move around everywhere. And you will see there was sufficient means to go around. I mean, what the heck? He's already drove away from one accident. But it wasn't an accident because she didn't hit him. He didn't hit her. Now, granted, it might not have been the smartest thing in the world to do, but she's young. She sits there and listens to authority. She believes that people still have good in them. And she comes out with the phone. Hey, I got the police on the phone. You need to go back to that accident. You need to go back here. Only to hear that engine rev up and try to ram. And you hear the engine in the 911, you hear the scream. And yes, you're going to hear the screams turn from the calm person on the phone to somebody, a little frantic. And as she gets up there close with that phone, lo and behold, guess who grabs her and tries to pull her in that car? Now, the witness will tell you there's no gun pulled at that time, it's just a phone. She just wants them to talk here. Talk to them. They want to talk to you. They want you to go back. They want me to go back. But that's not what she found out. And she found a very valuable lesson that a lot of people already know. Don't ever walk upon somebody in a car where they're trying to leave the scene of the accident or just leave. Because you don't know what you're going to find. You don't know what's behind that wheel. You don't know what's in that car. Well, she didn't know what was in that car. There was a lot of things in that car. A lot of things that shouldn't be in that car. They're going to show you pictures of a knife. They're going to show you pictures of a chain. Or a small, uh, I guess a, a small saw. Work tools that can be used aggressively to cause substantial, serious, immediate harm. But at that point... She's not thinking about that. She's shocked that the guy grabbed her when he's just trying to hand the phone or let the phone see that the police are on it to talk to him. And upon grabbing her, he's pulling her into the car. And you will see pictures. 
and you will hear testimony, and you will see scratches all over her neck, scratches on the back of her head, all these bruises on her face. You're going to see those. These are, these are evidence that are going to come in. These pictures were taken right after the incident. And you're going to see her shirt just ripped completely wide open. And she's there trying not to expose herself. So yeah, she did go put a hoodie on because it was exposing herself. And you'll see this shirt. You'll see this, the rip. You'll see the pictures of him trying to pull her in the car. And she's screaming, get out of her. Get off of me. Get out of the car. She does let him know she has a gun. And his response, or something that we, we probably shouldn't say if somebody says they have a gun. <clears throat> but nonetheless, as she's trying to get back from the car, and she's pushing, and she's screaming, you'll see the marks on her knees, where she's up on her tippy toes getting pulled, and she's trying to use her knees to get back. And he's leaning in there trying to grab something. And you'll be able to see the contents of what was in that vehicle. And you'll be able to use your common sense and your experience when you see it to see, hmm, what was about to happen, what was going to happen, what may have been said. But nonetheless, she does go to pull the gun. As she's being pulled from this side into the vehicle, and she's being pulled from this side trying to get her gun, bam, there's another hand. And you will see pictures. You'll see a quick video that shows what happened. But when you slow it down and you look at the still shots, you're going to see what happens. And you're going to hear the forensic examiner and the forensic for the gun parts come in and say, this gun, which is a 9mm, a Springfield, that's notorious for not having the shells jammed. But yet in this case, that shell, that spit shell is jammed in that gun. And as the state pointed out to you, there's male DNA all over the top of it. As this gun is being pulled back and pushed back at her. And as they're screaming and frantically pulling and pulling and bam, this gun goes off. And you see her grab that phone and immediately, oh my God. He just pulled the trigger on my gun and shot himself. We need an ambulance. We need the EMT out here. Please, we need the EMT. As witnesses walk around talking, asking questions, she's continuously saying, Where's the ambulance? There's one right there. Get an ambulance here. He just shot himself. She has no malice intent. She's never seen anything like that. 21 years old. But she knows somebody's hurting and they need an ambulance. And then you're going to hear the forensic. And the forensics are going to come in and tell you the projection of that bullet. And what they say, the witnesses, is you just walk up, pow, and shot him. There's going to be a projection. There's going to be an angle. There's going to be a direction these bullets are going into. And you would presume if he's driving, she's right here, if he's grabbing, the projection will be left to right. The moment, if, if what they're saying is right, but you're going to hear the forensic examiner come in and say, now this bullet can stuck at close range. It's not way over here pointing. It's at close range. And it's at an angle slightly right to left. Because when the gun is grabbed and turned back, that's the angle it is. That's why the male DNA is on the top of the gun. That is why you see her pull her arm back when it goes off. Because it's being twisted to a point that he's trying to shoot somebody or shoot her. It's not just struggling with the gun. It's an angle of the gun that's being pointed. As he grabbed her and started pulling her in and the weapon is pulled out and it's pointed and shot. And then she immediately grabs the phone. Like I said, this is a trap. People that have been around, that have driven that road, that know, they don't walk up on cars trying to talk to them civilly and say, hey, here's the police. And that was a learning experience to show the person had to find out. But that doesn't constitute murder. 
That doesn't constitute having all these charges put on her. She told from the very get-go, immediately, not thinking about what can I say or what should I say. She picked up that phone immediately and told him, my God, he just shot himself with my gun. We need an ambulance. If somebody's maliciously trying to kill you, they don't ask for an ambulance. They don't pick up the phone and say, hey, let me walk over here and talk to you a little bit. You know, um, she immediately picks up Scrooge's ambulance and she says it numerous times when the police are talking to her, when she's talking to the witnesses, and everybody's just in shock. They all agree. They need an ambulance. And as it was discussed earlier, there obviously was some kind of a traffic or some kind of a delay. Because it took a while. It took a while to get that ambulance out. The second they got there, those EMTs jumped on it, started working on them, talking to them, still breathing, making sure he's okay, trying to get him out of that vehicle, get him to the hospital. And unfortunately, when he gets there, he didn't make it. So as I said, this is a tragedy. But I, I employ you, empower you, listen to all the facts. That's all I want you to do, listen to all the facts. They have not been given so far. And my job as an attorney is to try to bring out as many facts as I can so that you have the full picture. Because I anticipate sometime in this trial, you're going to hear verdict. And you're here, we want you to come to a verdict. And verdict is Latin for seeking the truth. But if the evidence is not presented, or it's curtailed, or taken away, or left out, or manipulated to not give you the full truth, then verdict means seeking a conviction. And at what cost, and at what expense, and what is left out. So I am going to keep your eyes, ears, look at it, use your experience, listen to the forensics, listen to what they're saying. Sit back and visualize and use your own experience. Could this happen? Is this true? How could somebody do something malicious? And look for a motive. What kind of motive? Motive. But they didn't like the driver. I didn't like the driver's going to shoot somebody. Come on, people at 21, they don't want to. They don't want to shoot anybody. They don't want to get involved, really. They want to just get on YouTube and go viral. But not this day. She just tried to help out. She followed what the correction officer told her to do. She followed what 911 said, could you do? And at that time, when they said, all right, stop, stop, stop. She's already engaged. She doesn't think something like this is going to happen. She believes that if you put a phone up there and it's the police, you're going to talk to them or at least respect their authority. And on this day, it wasn't respected. It was knocked out of her hand. And the other hand grabbed her and started pulling her in the car. And some will give accounts of what he said. You know, I got something for you, bitch. Or I've got, get in here, I've got you. Or screaming. And that's when the profanity is going back and forth. I'm not saying it's, it's not going to be screaming back and forth. But what you hear in these 911 tapes. And what you hear going on, there's only one conclusion we can come to. And that's that she was following, as naive as it may be, and some may even say as dumb as it may be, her intentions were good as she followed the direction of authority. And as she followed it, it put her in a situation she'd never been in. And at the result of it, she did the only thing a caring individual would do. We're all human, no matter what. No matter gender, color, race, right we're all human. And the only humane thing to do when somebody is shot is try to get help or try to get an ambulance. And that's what she did. As for the proximate cause of the death, and once again, it's a tragedy. So we can look at it and look at all that. But look at all that occurred. Look at what you've got to listen to and what you've got to make a decision to. Because I believe if we can get all this evidence in, that I've seen if we can get all this evidence in, and I don't think we are, if we can get it all in, you're going to be able to make the right decision. 
And a right decision, not only can you look at the state when you make that decision, but you can look at hand of hand in the eye too. And you can know right here and right here, you made the right decision based on the evidence you heard, based on the evidence you saw, based on the experience and knowledge you had. So I welcome you to sit and listen to all this evidence. I will try my best to bring in as much as I can. There will be some objections. There will be some stuff taken out that's probably going to be done. Hmm, why was that taken out? Judge, I'm going to object to that comment. That's an absolutely inappropriate comment. As you just instructed this jury, their job is to not consider evidence that was properly excluded because it doesn't comport with the rules of evidence. And so his encouragement to consider what I object to and to consider what's excluded is highly inappropriate. And I would ask that he be that the jury be instructed to disregard that comment and that counsel be instructed to not make any such further inappropriate comments. And, Your Honor, I, I would say I'm not referring to what we had a conference about. There's going to be other issues that are just not there. And the jury has the right to sit back and say, hmm, why isn't it there? I'm not specifically saying the one that we had it, but there's going to be a lot of stuff that's not there. And they're to use their knowledge and experience to understand if they carry their burden beyond a reasonable doubt. And evidence not being presented helps them in that decision. So I'm going to sustain the objection and instruct you not to engage in that uh, attorney talker. Engage in missing evidence? Correct. Okay. All right. I apologize. I apologize. But you'll have enough to see. You'll have your own experience, your own knowledge. You'll get to make your decision based on what you see and what you know. I feel comfortable that when you see all this and you hear it all, there's no audacity. There's no somebody being malicious. It's a situation that somebody very young got put in following the direction of authority that by the grace of God she's alive to take today. And I don't want to take away from the tragedy of the loss because it is. But I do want you to look at how it came to be and if somebody has committed malice murder or felony murder or false imprisonment, this is a young girl doing what she was told to do and you will hear the evidence. And I won't take any more of your time because I'm ready to get in that evidence. Thank you so much and at the end of the trial, as I said, no matter what decision you come to, be able to look at the state, be able to look at my client, say he made the right decision. And I believe once the evidence is done, you'll be able to do that. And let her know she's not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Tucker. Is the state ready to call its first witness? Yes, Judge. Okay. The state calls Vicki Harry. Teresa, help you, God. Yes, I do. You can take your hand down and have a seat. And Ms. Herring, I'm just going to ask you to project into that mic so that everyone in the courtroom and the court reporter can hear you. Yes, Thank you. If you would please introduce yourself to the jury. My name is Vicki Lynn Herring. And can you spell all three of your names? V I C K I E L Y N N H E R R I N G. And are you related to Kenneth Herring? Yes. And how are you related to Kenneth Herring? I'm his baby sister. When uh, was Kenneth born? 1956. <laughs> okay. Yes. And how much older was he than you? I was born in 1963. And where did y'all grow up? In Norman Park, Georgia. In the time that you spent around uh, Kenneth, were you ever aware of any medical conditions that Kenneth had? I knew, I know that he was a diabetic, severely. Were you aware of any type of medications or anything that he had to do in order to manage his severe diabetes? He was insulin dependent.
And when you talk about insulin dependent, are we talking about pills or injections? Um, he was on injections at the time. May I approach the witness, Judge? Yes, you may. I'm showing you what's been pre marked as State's Exhibit Number One. Do you recognize State's Exhibit Number One? Yes. And how do you recognize that? That is my brother. And is this a photograph that you uh, provided to the DA's office so that the jury would be able to see what Mr. Herring looked like in life? Yes, ma'am. Is that a fair and accurate photograph of your brother? Yes. Go to this time, state tenders, state's exhibit number one. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. Okay, and then without objection. And we would request the opportunity to display which is being displayed. Your Honor, those are all the questions that I have. Uh, for Ms. Herring. Okay, you can take that down. Attorney Tilker, any cross-examination? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You, um, where shall we place this? Is this good? Okay. Thank you. Ms. Herring, my condolences to you for your loss. Uh, my name is Matt Tucker. I'm the attorney for uh, Ms. Payne over here. And I just have a few questions to ask. Um, what kind of work was Mr. Herring in? He, at the time, he was doing some odd jobs. Okay, did he wear a suit all the time? I saw the picture of him in a suit. Did he wear a suit all the time, or did he wear kind of work clothes? Or? He wore work clothes when he worked. Okay. And did he do a lot of work in, out of his car? Did he have a bunch of tools and, um, I guess, things to assist him in his, his job? He may have, yes. Okay. You weren't familiar with what was in his truck? No, as I was not there at the time, I had I didn't know what was in his truck at the time. And, and I don't have to just restrict it to that time. Did you ever see his truck? I know that truck because it belonged to my father. Okay. So, um, but you didn't know the contents, what was in the truck, correct? You just knew it was your father's truck passed down? I didn't know what was in the truck at the time. What do you have in the truck other times, do you know? And just Your Honor, there's going to be a lot of items and pictures that are shown. I just want to know how long those items were in the truck, if people had knowledge of it being in the truck prior to that day. Okay, I'm going to um, sustain the objection and ask you to move on in terms of the questions because I don't find it relevant. Okay. Um, you stated that you knew he was diabetic, correct? That is correct. Did he have one of those EpiPens uh, that they were used to inject insulin or to assist if he was having a flare-up or diabetes, low sugar, high sugar? I had not seen one. I had seen him use a needle. Okay. Did you ever assist him with that needle? I did not. Um, did he ever say he had problems injecting with that needle or any needles? He never disclosed any to me. Okay. And he never said anything about an EpiPen? That would be kind of the alternative of taking a needle out and injected himself? I never discussed it with him in depth. Okay. So, you, but you said you knew he had diabetes? I do. And did, were you there at a doctor's appointment when the doctor disclosed, or did he disclose it to you? Or He disclosed it to me, yes. And he never once talked about the EpiPen versus an injection? He did not have that discussion with me. Okay. And... Um, how many times do you see him uh, use an inject or do an injection? I saw him on a couple occasions. Okay, do you know how much he had to inject into him? or? I do not, and I never ask. I, I, I'm trying to find out the amount. Well, let me allow uh, Attorney S uh, Chief Assistant to make the objection. And I, I didn't, I stopped. Okay. 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 So, you weren't that familiar with these injections. You just knew that he had done them from time to time, correct? Yes. And um, and you weren't present at the doctor's appointment when he was diagnosed with this or told how to to handle the injections. No. Okay. No further question. Okay. Any redirect from the state? No, Judge. Okay. Um, may this witness step down? We are requesting that she be excused okay. so that she may uh, remain in the courtroom. Okay. 
So you're excused and you will remain in the court. Thank you. The state may call its next witness. Your Honor, the state calls Terry Robinson. Are you going to swear him in, ADA Hunter? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Would you raise your right hand? Do you swear and affirm the testimony that you will provide to this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? Yes, sir. All right, you may have a seat. Pull yourself up to the microphone. If you feel comfortable, can you remove your mask and talk clearly into the microphone so the court reporter can take down your testimony? If you don't feel comfortable, then just make sure you speak clearly into the microphone. Yes, ma'am. All right, could you please state and spell your name for the record? Terry Robinson, T-E-R-R-Y-R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. And Mr. Robinson, what is your current occupation? I work for the Department of, Georgia Department of Corrections. And what do you do for the Georgia Department of Corrections? I work in uh, infirmary operations, um, securing uh, inmates, managing uh, those particular things that operations will be have for the um, state of Georgia. Okay, and you stated you work in the infirmary. Can you give us kind of your duties and responsibilities and what your day to day would look like in that role? Well, in that particular role, what we do is manage, make sure that our inmate the offenders are taken care of when they come into our facilities. We generally like a symbol like a hospital, but making sure the uh, op operations are made management making sure that these particular um, offenders are taken care of. That's basically, basically it, by watching over them and keeping them secure. Okay, do you work closely with any of the nurses in these facilities? Of course. And what are, you, what are your duties as far as the nurses are concerned? Um, making sure they're safe, making sure they're safe, making sure that nothing takes place with them, um, watching them as they manage and placement and give out um, medical or assisting their um, offenders as needed. Okay, have you ever been involved with inmates who are having medical conditions? Yes, all the time. I mean, basically when they have certain things, when they happen with them, we call the nurses down to make sure that they see after them and everything. Um, basically, just making sure that the nurses are aware and that the doctors come down to just as well. And have you had the opportunity to just observe the inmates when they're either diagnosed with certain certain conditions or being treated for certain conditions? We do. We pay attention to that, but basically just when they're saying that this particular um, offender has this particular um, disease or either something's taking place with that particular offender, and that's about it. But we don't diagnose it. I'm not a medical. I just make sure that, again, making sure that the nurses and doctors are secure. And how long have you worked in that role with the Georgia Department of Corrections? Eight years. And have you had the occasion to observe patients who were diagnosed with diabetes? Yes, we have. And have you observed um, what physical manifestations may occur in the event that um, someone with diabetes may be having a particular condition or episode? When they're going on a certain shock or something like that, and basically we did see how they get seizures and stuff, that nature and stuff, but other than anything else that's severe, um, mostly the nurses are there to help them give them medication before they go into that certain stage. But if they go into a certain thing, we observe like some of them may have like yellow eyes, uh, 
glassy eyes of that nature and nature stuff or having a diabetic of a shock or something like that. Now, are you currently post-certified? Yes, I am. And were you post-certified on May 7th of 2019? Yes, ma'am. Now, were you on duty on May 7th, 2019? No, ma'am. I was off duty. That was one of my off days. I was off. So you weren't in uniform? No, ma'am. Now, let's talk about an incident that you witnessed that occurred on May 7th of 2019. Did you witness a vehicle collision on May 7th, 2019? Yes, ma'am. And where did that collision occur? Um, Clark Howell and Forest Parkway. And is that location in Clayton County? Yes. And are you familiar with that area? Yes, I am. And how often would you say you've driven in that area? Plenty of times. When it, before it even came, before the fifth one way came, I've been in Atlanta mostly 38 years, so yes. And do you recall why you were in that area that day? Um, heading home, um, unfortunately coming up, I was kind of leaving Camp Creek um, but there was an incident on 285, uh, boarded 285, came across, got on highway, I um, came on Interstate 85, worked my way around. There was another incident on Riverdale Road, up at Riverdale Road, worked my way around by t towards the uh, airport um, where the uh, cargo area is, and that's when I took Clark Howell because they were saying 75, 85, there was an accident over there. <laughs> so I worked my way around to come down to uh, Clark Howell. So the traffic conditions were just really horrible hey, on that day. I, I, it was weird. I was that was I never seen three accidents in one day, but that was taking place and happening. Now, did you witness the entire incident that occurred? Yes, ma'am. Now, can you tell us what happened during that vehicle collision on Clark Howell and Forest Parkway? As we were approaching them, um, the, the light the light was green. The vehicles were turning to the left, and the truck I know was turning right. All of a sudden, I seen this maroon vehicle come, bam, hit the side of the truck. It lifted up, came to a stop. When I was approaching, coming down, I saw the, the sound of the maroon vehicle, and I saw the gentleman kind of slumped over a little bit. That's what made me pull over to see if he was okay. And I, when I got the car, that's when I asked the gentleman, "Is he okay?" And then the uh, truck driver came up next, and then we just, just basically making sure the gentleman's okay. That's when I called 911. All right. So just to be clear, can you describe the vehicles that were actually involved in the collision? What they looked like in their uh, color? Like I said, it was a white um, 18 wheeler. The truck, I don't know what the name, I forget the name of the truck, but the company, but the maroon vehicle, and I seen the Jeep, and there was another, it was, I think there was another car, I think it was a white car on the other side. So what vehicles actually collided during that incident? The actual collided was the, the maroon, the maroon uh, vehicle, and the, uh, semi-truck. All right, so you got out of your vehicle um, and tell me what specifically you did once you pulled your vehicle over. Again, once I pulled over, I went to the um, driver who was in the maroon vehicle and asked whether he was okay. Um, he was really confused, dazed. I was looking at him and said, well, you know, do you need any help in the system? That's, again, that's when I called 911, asking if he needed help. And he said, what happened? I said, sir, are you okay? You know, he said, well, I, oh, what happened? What happened? I said, sir, you was in a car wreck incident. And then that's when the, uh, again, like I said, the other driver came up and he said, is he okay? Is he okay? I said, well, let's see if I get in a bus here. He needed an ambulance. And that's when, like I said, it was recorded on a 911 call. That's when I ask for the assistance. Now, when you made contact with the driver in the maroon truck, what were your observations of him physically? Physically, the scene that he was, again, out of it. Uh, like I said, I noticed his eyes were a glassy effect. Again, I, I, and, and again, not being a professional, uh, a doctor or anything, just saying that 
was he going through a diabetic situation or whatever? I didn't smell any alcohol on him. I let a sore, but I just noted that the gentleman was, you know, out of it. So you didn't smell any alcohol? No, I did not. All right, after you checked on the victim in the, or the driver in the maroon truck, what did you do? Did you check on anyone else? Um, just yes, checked on everybody, make sure they were fine. I noticed Miss um, the uh, other young lady who was driving the Jeep, asked her if she was okay. She said she was okay because her car vehicle went up on the um, ramp side. And other drivers, they were okay. And I, I, some of them just left the scene because they didn't, he didn't, he avoided, they avoided hitting him. So the only one checking on was her and the truck driver. Okay, I'm gonna hand you what has been previously marked as State's Exhibit 2. traffic of a 285 or either uh, 7585 and I'll take this way to, to travel out. So you have something familiar with this area. And is that the area where the incidents would have occurred? This incident right here, this is Forest Park Ray Penis Boulevard. This is where when I came up, when I left the scene this further down the way, Clark Howell and Forest Park Ray, that's when I came up and asked what took place and happened because I just seen the scene and they said that something took place with that. And you would have traveled that route to get to that location? Yes, I had to come from Clark Howell heading west to get to the lithical location because this is the corner where the McDonald is and this is 285 right here. Any objection? Okay, admitted without objection. And Your Honor, we will also be submitting State's Exhibit 2A for demonstrative purposes, which is just an enlarged photo of the map that was just submitted into evidence, the State Exhibits 2. All right, Mr. Robinson, can you identify the direction where you would have come from from the initial incident of the vehicle um, uh, accident? I would have, we would have came, I would have came from this direction right here heading again west to this location on this one. 
Put the cake from the west, hit it from the east, hit it west as well. All right, thank you. Now, what damages did you observe to the red maroon truck after the accident? Um, the front end was heavily damaged. Um, radiator fluid, all water was leaking out. Um, as I observed, and everything was heavily damaged to the front. Was the vehicle operable? At the time, it wasn't because it was off. Um, but <laughs> we see it happen that he was able to turn it on and leave the scene. Because I was thinking that as me and the truck driver, this, this vehicle is not going anywhere. Because after seeing all that on the floor, on the, on the grounds right there, I assumed that, hey, the vehicle was uh, disabled. Okay, and you stated you did um, call 911? Yes, we did. Yes, I did. How many times did you call 911 this day? Twice. Okay. I'm showing you what has been marked previously marked as exhibit three. Do you recognize it? Yes, ma'am. And what do you recognize it to be? Um, the, the recording of the um, 911 call. And have you listened to those 911 calls? Yes, ma'am. And how do you know that these this disc is specifically the 911 call that you listen to? Because I initialed it right here. And was the 911 call you listened to um, accurate as to what the call was on that day? Of that day, yes. And Your Honor, State would like to move State Exhibit 3 into evidence. Any objection? Presuming that as soon as it starts, it's his voice and it's identified as 911, no objection. Okay, admitted without objection. Your Honor, permission to publish? Yes. Yes, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, man, I'm talking to the gentleman who was at the trailer turn. Mm-hmm. And he was on the car and twerking him. You know, they know what happened. He fell asleep. So you need to be looking at that. Don't start it. Don't start it. Just smoke it. Sir, just fuck. Right there, right there. Now, Mr. Robinson, why did you continually ask for an ambulance during this 911 call? Concerned about the big victim. He was out of it, bike and forth, you know, and like I say, he was, you know, his eyes, uh, the way he was carrying on, how he was looking and everything, I was concerned. And I felt like they needed to have an ambulance there to, to observe him. Okay, and after you made that 911 call, um, what other observations did you have of the victim? Um, well, he got the truck. He walked around the vehicle and everything. He was walking around the vehicle just making sure that, you know, just walking around. But he didn't, you know, make the attempt and do anything strange at that time, um, well, I can recall. Um, and that was basically it. He was just walking around. And I was talking to the other um, person, on the truck driver, and, and talking to um, this, um, the young lady there. Um, and that was basically it. And we was just waiting for um, CP, uh, Clayton County to appear, or something. Clayton County or either ambulance to come. Now, after you made the first 911 call, did you have any other communications or conversation with Mr. Herring? When he started to get, you know, what he, he, he got, back, he was, well, he, I'm sorry, he got back into the truck. I'm gonna call. He got right in the truck, and I said, "Well, sir, are you okay?" Like that, and he's like, I'm, "I'm, I'm ready to go." Like I said, "Sir, you can't go anywhere. You know, can't go anywhere." He, he was in the, he was in the uh, incident. You can't leave the scene like that. And after that, he just you know was sitting there, and I was still talking and talking to them, and all of a sudden, he turned on the vehicle, and I was like, "Well." Sir, you can't do anything. You can't move. You can't move. And that's when he put it in, put it in the drive, and floored it. And I was like shocked. I said, "Well, God, this vehicle moving." I thought it was disabled. And thinking in my mind, I should have took the keys. That came in my mind. Across, I should have took the keys or stopped. But again, just thinking that the vehicle would be disabled, it wouldn't be able to drive off. But right there, that happened. And once Mr. Heron got back in the vehicle, um, when did you make the second call to 911? After, that's when he, again, waiting for them to come, waiting for them to come and everything, and saying, hey, they, you know, what's taking them so long? I understand this incident's taking place, but what's taking so long? And then that's when he, that's when, between that time when I made that phone call, that's when he, Accelerate it all. Now, how much time had passed between the first 911 call and the second, and your second 911 call? It was like way over 20 minutes. Because we were trying to figure what, what's taking so long. Now, did the defendant um, and Mr. Herring ever speak or communicate with each other while they were on scene? No. No. She was standing over there by the truck driver. She had communication with him, just talking to him right there. Um, they did make conversation. And did you secure the area, the scene, to keep people separate and apart? Well, basically when I told them who I was and everything, they're saying I was off-duty officer, state officer, and that was it, basically, and I'm, you know, here, just waiting for the, you know, just here to help and wait for um, um, assistance to come in. Basically, we're asking for Clayton County or either um, the ambulance to come on that, but everybody was standing where they were. They wouldn't, she or he was not near his, um, the driver. So they never exchanged words? No. no, not at all. All right, I'm gonna play the your second 911 call.
Robinson, when you stated, take a picture of the tag, take a picture of the tag, who were you talking to? I was talking to the, um, the driver, the Jeep driver. And do you see that person um, in the courtroom today? Yes. And can you describe her by an article of clothing? Well, can you describe them by an article of clothing they're wearing, identify where they're sitting in the courtroom? Uh, they're sitting over to my right. She has long uh, brunette hair, and she has um, a blouse on with a cross. All right, let the record reflect the witnesses identify the defendant in open court. Now, when you contacted 911, um, where was the defendant physically at that time? Hey, she was standing off to the side. I mean, she was just standing off to the side over there, just really by herself, standing to the side. Now, when Mr. Herring got in his vehicle, um, where was the defendant physically standing? Or Again, where was she? Again, standing up to the side. She was over there to, towards her vehicle and just standing to the side. Now, when Mr. Herring began to drive off, where was the defendant physically? 
I didn't at first. I didn't observe where she was. Then I was focusing on him where he was going, and then all of a sudden I seen her vehicle coming to the side, and then that's again it's a yes. Go get his tag. Get his tag. Get his tag. And I was telling her get his tag. Take a picture of his tag. So was the defendant already in her vehicle? Yes. When you told her to take a picture of the tag? Yes, yeah, she was moving. Yes. Now, outside of what we hear on the second 911 call, did you specifically tell the defendant to pursue Mr. Herring? To pursue, well, again, told her to go get the tag. So you didn't tell her to? No, I didn't tell her to apprehend or a cause to or stop the vehicle to so to get the tag, picture of the tag. Because at the time, we didn't have, I didn't have a picture of the tag. So did you tell the defendant to stop Mr. Herring's vehicle if she was able to catch up to him? Oh, uh, no. Did you tell the defendant to use whatever means, including deadly force, to stop Mr. Herring from getting away? No. Now, did an officer ultimately arrive um, to the incident location? Yes. Now, do you know how soon the officer arrived after the defendant left the scene? It had to be like, if I can recall, at least another 10 minutes, eight, give or take eight to 10 minutes, because that's when, I, when he rolled up and he said, um, and I noticed a, a black vehicle heading fast, uh, SUV heading fast towards on, on, on Forest Parkway, heading in that same direction, the river that road. And then he said, well, there was an incident down there. And I said, well, I'm going down here. I'm going to drive down there to see if they caught up with this, the person and everything. Because I know the vehicle was coming fast. So I did, and that's when I drove down there. And I sent the commotion and I got up, I parked my vehicle over towards the, um, McDonald's. I said, what happened? What happened? They said, she shot her. I said, who shot who? Your response, Katie. No, no further questions, Your Honor. Okay. I will uh, sustain the objection and the jury will disregard the hearsay. Uh, do you have cross-examination? Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. The jury, they've been sitting for a while. I'm gonna give a quick break and then allow you to do the cross-examination. So it's 4.15. Um, again, I know some of you have child care um, arrangements to put in place. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that since we may be here uh, past five o'clock. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and it's now 4.15. Just be back at approximately 4.35. Thank you.
That's correct. And uh, getting a chance to hear the uh, 911 and talking about it, you kind of refresh your memory of what occurred on that day, May 7th, correct? Yes. And if I may uh, approach the diagram, you know, yes, you may. And you were talking about an accident that occurred, you said it was right here? You talking about the accident before? Or after? I'm talking about the accident with the 18 wheeler that you saw. No, well, I saw it happen further up the road. Up here? Yes. So that's not an accurate representation of what you saw with the accident with the 18 wheeler, correct? That is correct. Okay. And what you saw there, you didn't firsthand see it. You came up on the scene after the fact and saw vehicles there, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, uh, at the time of the incident, as they do in all incidents, they asked you to write a written statement, correct? Correct. Okay. And as you listen to your 911 tape, did you say anything in there about diabetes or somebody having the diabetic shock or anything like that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And if I may approach your own. You may. And what I hold here is to exhibit number two. If you could look at that um, and make sure that's a correct copy of what you wrote the day of the accident. Yes. Does that appear to be a fair and accurate representation of what you wrote in the statement? That's what it says. Sir. Does that appear to be your signature? Yes, it is. At this time, Your Honor, I would tender exhibit, defense exhibit number two, which is a written statement from Mr. Officer Robinson on the day of the incident. Any objection from the state? No, I don't think so. Okay. And well, we don't have a projector here, do I? Mm -hmm. Oh, we do? Okay, yeah. great. DJ and a light director here in a minute. And in that statement there, do you recall stating that? You saw an accident that occurred at Forest Parkway and Clark Howe Road involving a semi truck and a Dodge pickup truck. That's a okay. And do you see that later on down there? You say he looked impaired. And, at, and you asked him if he was okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Did he say that he needed any medical attention? He was groggy like and silent, so he wasn't really answering the question, sir. Okay. And you, you told him to stay in his truck, correct? I did. And he refused and started walking away? Started walking around. Walking vehicle. around? Was he walking around his vehicle or walking around his Walking around his vehicle. Was he looking at the vehicle to see if it was operational, like the tires or the front or the radiation? Again, he was just walking around the vehicle. Okay. 
And what date was this statement written on? The date is still in right here, sir. 5-7-2019? That's correct. Okay. And, and you stated later on that um, there was another person who was involved, a white woman. Was she actually involved in the accident? The, the one that you're describing here. As far as the vehicle is concerned and everything, she, the vehicle almost hit her vehicle. Almost right, so, yes. hit I the mean, she, she made a maneuver. What I saw was she made a maneuver and she went up, went up. But I was mostly focused on when he hit the vehicle, he hit the semi-trailer truck. That was the one he made impact on. Okay. Everybody so, else, unfortunately, he missed. Okay. So my question was very specific. Was she involved in the accident being hit by another vehicle? No. Okay. And this was on the 7th of May, correct? That's correct. All right. Now, did you have another opportunity to talk to the Clayton County Police regarding this accident? That day or? Well, we can go that day. Did you have a chance to talk to the uh, detective or anybody else from Clayton County that day? Other than um, after the incident occurred. Okay. But do you recall talking to a, a Detective Hayward or a Detective Moore on May 21st, 2019? Yes. Okay, and in this believe, interview? I'm not sure the, the day was, but I, they called me. If you would like, it could help you refresh your memory with a copy of the transcripts of what was said that day, if it would assist you. Um, that'll be fine. You mind? Yes, he does. Okay. Okay. You may approach. Thank you. You may take a moment to look at that and refresh your memory. I don't mean to rush you in any form of fashion, but I'm going to start re referencing page number five if you'd like to look at that one. Number five? Yes, sir. It should be labeled up in the top left hand corner. Top left hand corner. It'd be yeah, page number five is. Yes, I see it. Page five. Yes, that's the one I'm gonna start reference. Okay.
what am I referencing to, sir? Okay. If you could, uh, and that's refresh your memory. So you do recall the interview you had with uh, uh, the detective? Yes, yes, the two detectives. And do you recall in that interview that you said there was a Mr. Kimball, he was the truck driver, and that Miss Payne was present, and that you were speaking to both of them? Mm -hmm. And you made a reference that he keeps walking around, Mr. Herring. And why don't you just get back to your truck? Do you remember saying that to the detectives? It was stated right here, sir, but that's what took place. Okay. And you said that everybody was just waiting for the Clayton County Police, correct? Yes. Okay. And But they didn't arrive as quick as you wanted. And you came back and said, when asked, this guy was not looking good. They asked, what did you mean by that? Do you recall saying that he is getting irritable? And he said to you, what laws have I broke? Do you recall hearing that from Mr. Herring that day? Oh. I guess if it's in the statement right here, sorry, that's not to, to go by. Okay. And do you recall what you stated to him that you caused this incident? And you need to stay still? I'm going to stay right here, sir. That was a minute. Okay. And you recall thinking that you would have get, you should have gotten the keys or thinking about getting the keys from him, but you didn't feel like going through all of this. Do you recall? The state didn't need this information, sir. That's okay. And do you right. recall why you didn't want to get involved in all of this? Well, at the time, sir, I, again, I was trying to think. I was, I was there at the location. I was trying to observe, make sure everybody was okay. I was trying to apprehend this person when trying to do that particular thing, thinking that this person was this going through what it was going through. And you were trying to apprehend? No, I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wasn't try again, to, I wasn't trying to do anything of that nature. And that's because you were not in uniform? Um, if I was the if I were, again, if I was in uniform or something like that, I wasn't expecting that to take the place and happen. Again, I was expecting that um, the system would, I mean, people, the Clayton County would arrive and be there on scene to take care of the matter and go from there. I was not trying to do anything else, sir. But you said that you were trying to keep everybody safe, correct? Yeah, because cars were moving. People were coming, and so I made sure that I asked some people to move to the side and stay still. That's the only thing, because on the reason why, because this gentleman, I feel something was wrong with that person. And he was walking around irritable, so he was out of his truck, correct? If he's walking around, sir, yes. Okay. But the keys were in the truck, correct? Well, at the time, I, I don't know. I mean, here it is. He had out the vehicle, and... Again, I did not, after that, I didn't say anything else to do anything else because he was, again, I felt like the vehicle was not able to drive off because the, the damage was occurred to it. So because it was smoking and it was leaking a bunch of radiation oil or, or fluids, it's like, you know, he can walk around all at once, that thing's disabled, correct? Mm -hmm. So you would say it was a pretty strong impact on the 18-wheeler based on the damage of the vehicle. Based right? on the damage of the vehicle, yes. Okay. And then you stated that, if you could go to page number six. You stated that uh, your car is still smoking. You don't want to do that. Um, is that referencing to him getting in that vehicle and driving off? Pretty much. Okay. And that he stated to you like, well, I didn't break any logs or anything. Do you recall him saying that to you? Yeah, yes. I, yes. I mean, well, just looking at the statement right here. Yes. Okay. And now, Mr. Kimmel with 18, the driver with 18-wheeler, he's standing in front of his vehicle, correct? In front of Mr. Herring's vehicle, damaged vehicle, correct? Yes. And Mr. Hayne was in there just revving up the engine. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And as he's ramming up, Mr. Kibble's in front of the truck, 
And you tell him, sir, please, please, don't drive off of it. Don't move the vehicle. Do you recall telling him that? Yes. Okay. And sure enough, he threw it in the drive, and he drove off. Now, how close was Mr. Kibble to the front of that vehicle when he drove off? Do you recall? A couple of feet away. Okay. Because I believe, he, I, 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 yeah, just a couple of feet away. Okay. And you, you, what was going through your mind was, oh, my God, I, I don't see how this thing is driving. Pretty much. Okay. Now, on the 911 tape, you heard yourself saying, get a picture, get a picture of that, quick. Now, were you talking to Mr. Kimball, or were you talking to Miss uh, Payne? I bet at the time I was talking to Mr. Kimball, and that, that stated the name of Mr. Kimball. Okay. Were you aware that Miss Payne was on the phone with 911? I was time? not aware where she was on the phone. I know I was on the phone with 911. Okay. And did you see her have the phone to her head, or did you see her with the phone in her hand? No, I did not. Okay. She was actually in her vehicle driving to go behind the car or behind the truck, correct? Correct. And that was you in there saying, go, go, good, go, correct? Yes. Okay, that was directed clearly to Miss Payne, correct? Yes. And you didn't see her after that because she's going to get a picture of the tag, correct? Yes. Okay, so do you never said anything about please don't pursue? Or you never said anything like, hey, be safe, don't do this? I said get the picture of the tag. And you said, go, go, good, go. She's going to get a picture of the tag. Sir, you said a second ago that you said get a picture of the tag to Mr. Kimball, correct? Sir, at the time, at my memory can call, everything was moving fast. He was taking the picture of the vehicle as well as she was coming up driving. Okay. And so that's what stated, get a picture of the tag. Okay. But you said you didn't see her with a camera in her hand or a phone in her hand, correct? No, the only one I had a picture of, for if I recall, was Mr. Kimball had his phone in his hand, taking the picture, was trying to take a picture anyway. Okay, so just to clarify, so you're telling Mr. Kimball to take a picture, and you're telling Miss uh, Payne, good, go, because you only saw her vehicle going after uh, to get a picture of the tag, correct? Yes. Okay, do you recall telling the uh, detectives in that interview on the 21st after this fact, after you'd seen the pre the other result of the other incident that day, do you recall telling them, next thing you know she came around and I said, don't pursue, it. just get his license plate and just come back with the dispatch. Do you recall saying that in your interview to Detective Hayward and Moore? If it's written down here, I'm not going to call, but I don't recall that. But if it's written down here, I must have probably said it. I'm not sure. But if it's in this instance, in this affidavit. But on the day of the incident, you don't recall saying that or you didn't hear yourself say that on the 911 tape, correct? No, sir. Okay. And then... Uh, you also said that there was a white driver and a black guy was in a truck with him. And I told him, just get the license plate. Was there somebody else present that uh, was not identified? And it, it would be in your statements right there, just below what I said about, I told her don't pursue. Well, unfortunately, for, for, since it's been a length of time, but yeah, it was, I, I, I recall it was another gentleman he was in the vehicle, and he was over there as well. There's another person in the vehicle too as well, because he just pulled, as I recall, another vehicle pulled up. And you saw them driving off the same direction Ms. Payne was going in, correct? He headed that way. Okay, and you said to him, hey, get the license plate, get the license plate. That's pretty much. Okay, all right. <clears throat> and You said that basically after that all occurred, you kind of drove down to the location that you were identifying on the map there, correct? Correct. And that was the identification of an accident that you did not see, but you came up on it later, correct? 
Correct. Okay. And you parked over there at McDonald's, and you knew, I guess, an officer from Clayton County, and you stated to him that all she was supposed to do is just get the license tag plate. Don't do anything crazy. Do you recall saying that to Miss Payne on that I, day? I don't remember call, saying that anything to that like that, but I, that when I mentioned to the officer. Okay. And um, and you said that you knew that you told the woman, Miss Payne, not to pursue, but just get the license plate? I guess in the midst of a statement, I just addressed the same, addressed the situation, but I didn't make, I guess in the bit clear of that, but according to the affidavit, I, I don't recall making that statement right there, but I just made, again, what I said before, to get the license plate set. Because in the hustle bustle, the rush of what's going on, you had no clue it was gonna end up the way it did, correct? No, sir. Okay. So then when you found out it did end up the way it did, you came back and you stated in your interview, you know, it's like, it's just not worth it. And that is why you said to Ms. Payne, do not pursue him, just get the license plate. Did you see that in fresh memory in the page six of your statements to the detectives? I can't say I recall that right there. Okay. But again, it's written in the statement right here. No. But you further went on in that interview again and t said, after seeing the end result, that this is totally crazy. I told her, all we need is that license plate. Do you recall saying that in that interview? That was a general statement of saying that we need a different license plate. We was having a conversation with the detectives and stuff, but I didn't make a statement to her. We was having a conversation. And if it took another contact, that I was just making a conversation with the detectives. Okay. And once again, it was kind of a crazy situation, kind of a hit or miss. You need to make a decision quick. And that decision was get that tag, and she was driving to get it, so you were like, good go. And that's all you really said that you heard from you on 911, correct? That's what the recording says. Okay. And then if you could go to page nine of your interview with the detectives from May 21st, 2019. That first paragraph of what you were saying, if you could refresh your memory. Repeat what, sir? If you could just refresh your memory, the first paragraph of when you're responding. Do you recall saying that, please, come on, get back into your truck? You were talking to Mr. Heron, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and you were thinking to yourself, my God, what's taking so long? Why are the police taking so long? You recall that? Yes. And that's when he began, began walking up and down close to his car, looking at his car, correct? Again, he was walking around, sir. Okay. I wasn't observing really looking at what he was doing, but just making sure that he was safe. And then you said something to the fact that, hopefully you can elaborate this, um, after I guess, he must have saw something get in his truck and he got back in it. I said, what are you doing? He started his truck up again, began revving it up. You begged him to stop. And he said, no, I'm not gonna do that. Do you recall saying that? Yes, sir. So this is different than what you wrote from the day of the seventh, correct? Well, with me, the, the, the seventh was a brief statement, sir. Okay, a brief, statement. a brief statement. I wasn't trying to elaborate all too much because what was taking place and happening. 
And that brief statement was only regarding the incident that you saw, correct? It wasn't taken into account what happened after. Yes, the incident that took place happened at Clark Howell and Forest Parkway. So all of this additional information of what you thought in your head you were saying came from after seeing the aftermath and seeing what had occurred from that that, that day, correct? Yes, sir. I couldn't believe what took place and happened. That was, that was my reaction. And of course, you uh, you also uh, recall at the very bottom page of nine that. saying Miss pa Miss Payne's behavior was as far well as I say she was just looking like wow what happened what's going on is this guy okay is he drunk did you at any time during that period of time at the incident of the first accident ever make an implication or ever say he was impaired or drunk in the presence of Miss Payne or Mr. Kimball. I don't know if this is uh, yeah. I recall that we was in the conversation. And I don't recall this particular statement right here. I don't recall that other than us having a conversation of what, what was going on with the particular driver. But you do recall whether it's in your statement there, whether it's on the novel. You do recall asking Mr. Heron if he needed an ambulance, correct? That's correct. And you asked him on more than one or twice, two or three times, correct? In the statement. And his response sometimes were, I didn't do anything wrong, what laws have I broke? Do you recall that being a response when you asked if he needed an ambulance? I know he says that he made that statement and right there, yes. As I'm seeing this, this report right there. Okay. And you said also that you talked to Mr. Kimball, and Mr. Kimball was standing by, and when you asked him if he needed an ambulance, he said he was good. Correct? That's correct. Okay. But then he was saying, wow, is there something wrong with this guy? Is he drunk or something? Do you recall him saying that to you? I believe that was another conversation. Because yeah. again, we was, we was in the conversation. Yeah. Now, um, and you come lower on to say, did you notice that Miss Payne had any firearms on her? And you said, no, I didn't see a weapon on her. Do you recall that? Yes. I, and I, I wasn't really looking for a weapon on her, but... I didn't recall her having a weapon on her. And you recall also later on in your interview that you said it was kind of ironic or weird that you saw Miss Payne coming down. Let me make sure I said this right. Coming down 285, y'all were together, and all of a sudden when you came back on Clark Howe, she was behind you, and that would be the last page, page number 16. Yeah, I remember because I said I was coming from Camp, Camp Creek and that's when I noticed I seen the vehicle because I see it was a, I a purple, I believe. It's Jeep, pink and black. Pink, yes. uh, one of the colors on that nature and stuff, but indeed, other than that, when we and it ended up just like any occurrence, you wonder like, well, this other vehicle is here. So that was basically it. I, I didn't think nothing other, other than that, other than saying that, yes, the vehicle is right there. So it's fair to say that with all these accidents going on, you were trying to find an alternative route to get to where you're going, and it appeared Ms. Payne was kind of either following you or somewhere close by trying to find the same alternative I'm, route to avoid all the traffic. I'm not, well, I know we, I was avoiding trying to get away, get home and make my way up a route that I could feel that I can take this route, and if she was on the same road, she was there. And you never made a stop on your route when you were going, correct? You didn't stop off no. the gas. No, I just made my way around and to where I was and where the incident occurred. 
and she was kind of close by, so it's fair to say she didn't make any stops anywhere because she was right behind you or close by you on this alternative route. Correct? Not that I know of. Okay. And again, you, you weren't involved in the action. You only witnessed it from not where the location you pointed out, but the other location, the Clark Howe and Forest Parkway, correct? That's correct, Clark Howe and Forest Parkway. And you stayed there till the police came? I stayed there till the police came. And, and thank you for your service to know that. Um, and no one else got injured or hurt there at the, uh, the first location? No, sir. And you said that you work in the medical or you, you worked around medical uh, inmates or when you're a correctional officer, you see those that have been diagnosed with uh, disorders or diabetes or other medical conditions. Mm -hmm. Are, do you have any kind of training in that field or do you just go off what is being told from the, the nurses or the medical department? The medical department. When they state what's taking place with that person, I mean, I'm not a medical profession. I'm just there to make sure the place is secured, make sure that uh, the nurses and doctors are secured. So it's fair to say that if somebody didn't identify a, a medical condition with one of the inmates, you couldn't just ready available give a diagnosis by seeing them. Oh, right? no. Okay. We can't do that. All right. And do you happen to know what the characteristics are of a diabetic coma or shock? I've seen some things take place, but other than when they tell us that this person is going through, a, a professional would tell us that this person is going through a shock, or going through a diabetic shock, or going through a heart attack, having a seizure, and that nature of stuff, that's when they tell us what's taking place and happening. The professionals tell us that. I didn't, would not ever tell us something that first, other than something's wrong with this particular person, and that's for the nurse or someone for assistance. Okay, so it's fair to say that you're not qualified to just see actions of one person to make a diagnosis, correct? No, sir. Again, I'll, no. Thank Yes. Mr. Robinson, I'm going to refer to the same interview that Attorney Tucker was referring to on page four in your last paragraph, if you want to review that to refresh your memory. Page four? Yes. The last paragraph? Yes. And when you spoke with Detective Moore and Detective Hayward on May 21st of 2019, you indicated that as you were turning the corner um, as an officer, you decided to stop even though you were off. Um, when you saw Mr. Herring, you saw him slumped over. The car came to a creep. As the car came to a slow creep, you got out and checked to see if he was okay. You asked him if he was okay and everything like that. He seemed to be a little impaired. I could tell by his face, and working in the infirmary, you kind of get a feel for how these guys look when something is wrong. So on May 21st, 2019, you did inform detectives that you believed that there was something wrong with Mr. Herring at the scene of the first incident. Yes. And that was due to your experience in training and working at the infirmary? Yes.
and also on page 11. Paragraph four. You can read that for me and refresh your memory. Is that paragraph four? Yes. Where it says he was walking pretty normal. Correct. Right you don't here. have to read it out loud, just review it. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. And Detective Moore asked you if you noticed, was he walking okay? Was he walking in circles? Was he stumbling or anything? Or was he walking pretty normally? Um, you notified Detective Moore that he was walking pretty normal, mm -hmm. but he reminded you of a person like you would, like from when I was working in the infirmary and stuff. These guys, you know, when you're a diabetic and you go into shock and your mindset, you know, that's what it reminded me of. He kept asking me what day it was and stuff like that, and I said, okay, sir? Yes. So was it your observation of Mr. Robinson that he was having a medical condition? I felt like he was. I mean, again. Yeah, I believe my question was, was he suffering from a medical condition? I never stated what that condition was. And once again, he does have a medical training, and as he stated before, unless somebody has told him what the condition is, he's not qualified to identify it or categorize it. And if I may, Your Honor, I believe Mr. Robinson testified that he's not qualified to diagnose, but he has experience as in working with the Georgia Department of Corrections for eight years in the infirmary that if a nurse identifies what a person is going through, that he has witnessed that over a long period of time that he would be able to identify it as is currently occurring. Not a diagnosis, but he can recognize those symptoms of the person going through that particular condition. And he would be qualified to state if that's what he observed on May 7th of 2019. And I would just want it to be a layman's person. He's not an expert. He's not a doctor or nurse. He's not trained. A layman's opinion. So I'm going to um, overrule the objection. He can testify as to his observations. He's not given a medical diagnosis, so he can testify as to what he has observed that led him to his conclusion. So based on your observation of Mr. Herring on that day and your experience in working in the infirmary at the Georgia Department of Corrections, did you believe Mr. Herring was having a suffering from a medical condition? Yes. Now, just to be clear, when you yelled, take a picture of the tag or get the tag, the defendant was already in her vehicle, correct? Yes. She was all, the defendant was already in motion. Things are, again, happening pretty fast. Once he started, yes. So you didn't direct the defendant to get in her vehicle? No, I didn't. And you didn't direct her to get in her vehicle and go get the tag? You didn't say get in your vehicle and go get the tag? No, I did not. The defendant was already in motion? Yes. Now, we talked about defense defenses, I believe, Exhibit 1, which was your written statement. Defense, defendants Exhibit 2, which was a copy of your written statement. Yes. Now, how long have you been an officer, a correctional officer? At that time, that was in my what, four years, five, in my, almost only about four or fifth going on for five years at that time. And when you wrote this statement, did you 
believe that there would be further investigation in this case. Yes. And so you would have written what you believe to be would have been important in what happened at that time, correct? Yes. With the understanding that you would still speak with other investigators in this case? Yes. And you did do that on May 21st of 2019? Yes. And you recalled everything that you remembered from the incident that occurred on May 7th, 2019 in that particular interview? Yes. And you would have given them all the information that you would have recalled that happened on May 7th of 2019? Yes. Was there anything significantly different from your written statement and what you provided to the detectives on May 21st of 2019? Basically everything what was written there and written here, I mean, it clarified what was said and done or what I can recall at that time period. Thank you. You're stating that a person that walks around irritable and is asking, did I break the law? Am I breaking the law? Those are signs of diabetes or diabetes shock? I guess no. I didn't say that. Okay, but that's what you saw, correct? Again, sir, as he was making the movement, I felt something was wrong with this individual. I didn't say that. When did you find out that there was a possible diabetes or diabetic shock? When did you find out about that? I didn't say that, sir. I'm asking you when you did find out about it. Did you hear from the media? Did you hear from the detectives? Did you hear from investigators? No, sir, I didn't hear from no one. So you never once heard that there was a possible diabetes that was involved in this? No, sir. Okay, so then your contention is when you see somebody walking around irritable, saying I didn't break any laws, I'm going to drive off, see something in his vehicle, crank it up, and almost run over Mr. Kimball, that's a sign of diabetes or diabetic coma? No, sir. Again, I didn't make that statement. Again, the look he had on his face, I didn't say that this person was doing the following thing, saying he was going through that. I just said the look he had on his face reminded me of something like that. But you refreshed your memory from the statement you gave on the 21st, correct? And you remember on page 5 you said he was walking around irritable. And further on in that interview, you said he was asking, I didn't break any crimes, what laws did I break? Do you recall those? Yes. And that's all stuff that you saw that you saw him doing, correct? Yes, sir. I was right to stand by him. That's what I was trying to tell him when I made the statement right here. And you were telling him not to get back in his vehicle, correct? At the time, because of the vehicle doing what it was doing, yes. Okay. And you're stating that those are characteristics from your experience training and seeing individuals in the infirmary, that that is signs of a diabetic shock or coma? No, sir. I can't. I can't make those particular diagnoses. Again, that remind me of something like, again, his facial features that remind me of. I did say, again, that would remind me of. Now, you're post-certified, correct? Yes, sir, I am. And when you do all this training for post-certification, you're very clear about writing reports, correct? Yes, sir. And that anything, anything is important that you feel is important or you think might be important down the road, you need to memorialize it in your report, correct? We try to do those particular things. Sometimes I hit and miss. And you say you didn't put stuff that was important in your statement because you figured somebody would follow up with it? Well, again, when writing reports, sir, you give the details of then, then, then later on there should be, there will be, hopefully there will be investigations afterwards. So you anticipated there was going to be an investigation after you wrote your report and after the police showed up to take care of that accident? Which accident are you saying? The one that you witnessed, the only one you witnessed, the 18-wheeler and Mr. Herring. This generally happens when the accident occurs. They do investigations. I assume that's what takes place and happens. Most of our officers, most anything that takes place is an investigation afterwards. Now, you started off your testimony here 
with a diagram that you didn't give the exact location of this accident, correct? That you witnessed. The diagram showing there right. is where the incident, the other incident occurred. I stated that I came from the other incident down to the incident that took place afterwards. I just don't recall being asked, is this where the 18-wheeler and the truck had an accident? Um, they took, no, we said that the accident was occurred at Forest Parkway and Clark Hollow. That's what I stated. The incident happened with Forest Park and Clark Hollow. As I looked at that particular, and I stated that this is the McDonald's, this is where 285 and everything. I didn't state that that particular incident happened there. The first incident happened there. The first incident happened at Clark Hollow and Forest Parkway. And you didn't see the second incident. You just came up after it, correct? Came up afterwards. And you said that, I asked previously if you saw that she had a phone in her hand or that you knew she was on 911 on the call when Ms. Payne was driving her Jeep past you. I didn't see her on the phone. But you felt compelled to say, good, go, because you were on the phone with 911 trying to get the tag, correct? That's correct. Okay, and if if somebody in, uh, who's identified themselves as a correctional officer is asking somebody to take a picture of the tag and here somebody else is going to get the tag, says, good, good, go. You don't think that was a form of encouragement? To go to get, get the tag or take a picture of the take tag? Take a picture of the tag. We, again, I didn't have a picture of the tag. I was just, again, it would need a picture of the tag until afterwards, that's when Mr. Kimball said, hey, here's a picture, here's a picture. And that's when we then were able to give them clarity of the tag. But at that moment, you felt it was important to get a picture of that tag or to get some way to identify that vehicle, correct? Yes, because the person was fleeing the incident. And this person was fleeing the incident, having walked around his car, having walked around asking about breaking laws, and appeared, as you said, irritable. Yes. And at no time did you feel that you needed to take the keys out of the truck because you thought the truck was not going to move or was disabled? Yes, sir. Does the state have any more questions for this witness? No further questions. Okay. And may um, Officer Robinson be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Officer Robinson. Does the state have another witness? Should we do that we have to lay out? This is the witness who traveled from Virginia. She has indicated her willingness to spend another night. Okay. Uh, to accommodate so that we don't have to go so late. Okay. Well, right. we can call her, but she's agreed to stay the night. I think we all had a long day, maybe. Okay, so we'll call her first thing tomorrow? Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen um, of the jury, I uh, thank you for your service today. We are going to adjourn for the evening. It's now 5.25. I'm going to ask you to report back tomorrow at um, 8.30 so that we can promptly begin at 9 o'clock. Uh, the instructions still apply. Do not discuss. Do not do independent research. Ensure that you get some rest and we'll see you back here tomorrow at 8.30. Thank you.
address before we adjourn for this evening? Not that I'm aware of. None for the All right. If you can briefly approach, I just want to handle some scheduling matters. Thank you.